All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Mike, for being here. Really excited to have you do this talk. Um, just to start, I'll read a little bit of a bio and kind of some information. Um, while Bailey Gates confronts the conventions that continue to marginalize so many today, they do so without hostility. Instead, Bailey Gates photographs are joyous spaces of affirmation where those in front of the camera are free to imagine, perform, and exist as they wish. It's a seemingly simple underpinning, but for those who have traditionally been chastised for merely being, it is profound. At the heart of Bailey Gates' practice is a desire to reflect a world where gender, identity, and sexuality are boundless conditions, perpetually in motion and attuned to each individual and each moment. Bailey Gates knows such a world is real, and in looking at their photographs, we're able to catch a glimpse of it. Their recent book, a, a Glint in the Kindling, was published by Pinch Publishing in 2021, following their first solo show at the Ravistine Gallery in Amsterdam. Um, so just a little more personal background. Um, I've been a huge fan of Michael for a really long time now. Um, I've been following their work for years and I feel like it just really has always had such a strong like personal vision and perspective and is above else, I think just really exciting for me. I feel like when I look at their images, I get really inspired, I get excited, I get you know, I feel like he's always kind of one step ahead of, you know, whatever else is happening. And I'm just really excited to bring him on and to share the work with you guys. And I feel like you can take it away from there. Thank you. Thanks, Hobbs. That was such a great intro. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, let me screen share for starters. Here I am. Okay. Well, hi everyone. Uh, thank you again, Hobbs. I'm so grateful to be here and um, to be talking with you all today. Um, it was so nice looking through work this morning with Sophie and Hobbs. Uh, I feel like I'm kind of in crit again as well when I was in school. So I feel like I am, I've noticed I'm a bit rusty there, um, but let's just get into it because I think I have an hour um, and we want to open up for questions, possibly, too. <clears throat> so today I'm going to be showing some pictures, uh, work from my recent book, A Glint in the Kindling, um, which I released this past fall. It's work from 2017 to present. Um, I also put some, some pictures into, but really a body of work I feel like is aesthetically closest to my voice. Um, I like hearing photographers talk more about photography and their perspective on it. Um, so I'm gonna to try to be doing that as well. Um, less about the body of work, some formative ideas for my work and artists I've worked with um, kind of moments I've picked up from them that I think about often when I'm making my pictures. Um, my practice is definitely very concept heavy. I am more of a mystic rather than a rationalist and um, my themes are political and personal. I'm often playing with the concepts of a binary gender um, and I'm interested in surrealism, um, but it's always based in a feeling for me. I, I guess I kind of crave like a more intimate up close tableau photograph and um, all the work I'm showing today is analog. This is a picture called Bow that I made in 2021. Um, I grew up seeing a lot of pictures, a lot of paintings in New England of, of men with bows and hair accessories. And um, I always thought it was pretty gay. And um, it's, it still is to me now, I guess you can kind of say, like the passage of time allowed for a lot of reflection on, on that and my inspirations. Um, There's always a feeling in my work of, um, of doing something wrong. Um, photography, photography for me is like a very forbidden practice, I feel like. Uh, when I was growing up, um, 
I, I would set a timer. And when my parents would go out to go to the grocery store or something, um, I'd try to make my pictures during when they were gone and before the timer went out. And um, it's not that it wasn't, um, it wasn't a feeling of disapproval. Um, I didn't want to have them see me making a picture. It felt so private. And, um, but I feel like my parents just were pissed because I was like putting holes in the walls and breaking chairs. And like, they'd find like a mysterious string later attached to a ceiling. And there's always a sense of mischief that I'm, or doing something wrong that I've never really been able to get away from in my work. And photography is such a rush for me. And I'm saying this not because I'm, I'm bitter about it, but more so it's kind of become, um, a big part of my practice. It's like a similar feeling to um, like trespassing on like old farmer Joe's property or something and, and not wanting to get caught. And, um, but I always have that fear still. And it's kind of, it's it, maybe it's just anxiety, but it's become a big part of my practice. This picture is a photograph of myself and my good friend, Jane Mosley, um, who's an artist as well. And I was thinking about the confrontation of bodies at the time, uh, or the clash of being born into a physical body, um, looking at images of, of like female wrestlers and our, our bodies as a physical form. I feel like sometimes having a body feels like I'm in a, a state of competition or um, like it's like a full contact sport for a lot of the time. This is a photo of my, uh, my best friend, Bobby, who is somebody that comes up a lot in my work. Um, this photo was shot right before the pandemic. And it's, for me, I was, I had started like putting these pictures out as the pandemic started. And it was when that saying was, um, don't touch your face. And photography for me sometimes can feel like um, tarot reading or being a medium, especially when you're so, when I'm so connected to my subjects. Um, Cause a lot of the work I'm showing today is it's of people I've had relationships with for a long time. Um, but I think often when, I, I like to think when I'm with a medium or like a tarot reader, I notice that they're reflecting back um, who, who I am or they're attempting to. So I've always thought that photography kind of has that ability as well when you focus so closely on a subject. A part of my practice that I've become more aware of when I was putting together a glint in the kindling um, was this idea of an invitation to photograph. Um, when there's somebody in my life that I wanna photograph, I'm, I'm waiting for this permission slip to be delivered or to be delivered from a person really, um, permission to photograph and Obviously, looking through these pictures, I have favorite people, um, people where the, like, the invitation bridge feels open more regularly because we built that relationship like with Bobby. But this is a picture of Bryce Anderson, who's an artist and um, a model, and I perceive more of an invitation. Um, but waiting on the invitation to work for, from someone or waiting to be approached, the message sometimes isn't so obvious as, you know, like, a DM or an email, um, it can kind of be nonverbal, uh, but there's such a small window when the invitation arrives and it always comes. I feel like if I really wanna make a picture with someone, it could take like a year or, or at the most and or like a week, but um, I have found in the waiting to make a picture is where it's my time to get ready. In the waiting is where I prepare mm -hmm. and when the person feels stage ready, um, I'll say to them like, oh, how funny, um, I've had this idea for you. I, I've made this costume for you. I've had these ideas waiting for you. And uh, the alternative of, of not waiting and chasing people or um, I feel like it leaves me feeling really burnt out. It feels wrong to my practice and I don't think I'm meant for it. Um, it just feels clear for me to say, oh, that's great. You know, I've been waiting for you. I've been thinking of you, here's some ideas.
when I was in school, I had a teacher um, for the history of photography named Mary Jo Marks. And um, in one of her discussions, if anybody knows who this is, I've actually been trying to research and figure it out. But in one of the discussions, um, she talked about how a you have a water glass and you put down on a table. And when you lift that water glass up, you make a photograph. Oh, there's one right now. So it's an imprint, it's a, a stain. And that idea was really formative for, for my practice in making work was um, leaving an imprint of myself, um, you know, leaving an imprint of the people around me, this, this imprint of a water glass is saying, know this about me. Um, so to make a photograph or, or to leave an imprint, I want that. That's what I want from, from my pictures right now. Um, it, but sometimes I, I fail and sometimes I think I really know someone and I have this vision of them for a picture and the picture doesn't add up later um, for the both of us. And, um, you know, like angels, um, archetypes that feel really familiar to me, like a Madonna and child, um, portals, a transformation of a body. These are all themes that I feel are really important um, to my work. But when I talk about them, I notice people get kind of uncomfortable. And I think it's in the approach to these themes is, um, I read a, a review of Kara Walker's work once where um, said like there was no hero and villain in these narratives that um, you know there's an ability I, I interpreted that as this, is, this there's this ability to hold both and I think with all these archetypes like with Madonna and child or or with angels um, there's this ability to to be good and bad and um, everybody can be kind of a hero and a villain and or male and female. There's there's this ability to hold both that I feel like photography really can capture. And um, but it's the way I talk about these archetypes, not the subject matter itself. That is the point here. Um, I'm photographing a lot of relationships a lot of the time, queer relationships. Um, but when I say queer too, I was talking to, to Sophie about this too. It was, um, when I was in school too, my friend was photographer and artist, Leah James and Mars Hobrecker. Uh, they invited Flawless Sabrina to come to our school, who is um, this amazing performer who organizes drag in the US and was arrested throughout the way. Um, she, there's a great documentary, The Queen. Anyways, she came to our school towards the end of her life. And I was really in an academic way of thinking then and asked um, like, what is the job of a queer artist? And she was kind of like, I felt it was a lot of, it was very loud. And she was like, um, don't label the work as queer. Like um, just make, it, it, I, I can't remember exactly what she said, but it really was, don't think of anything, everything is under an umbrella. And that's in photographing these relationships in my life. Um, you know, there's so much um, magic to them and it's, it's, you know, not everyone has the same beliefs. It's, it's complicated. There's so many different layers to it. Um, but Bobby Menuez is somebody, you know, I've been photographing them for almost 10 years. Um, they're an artist and an actor and I, they're pretty limitless in what they can do. Um, and we've made so many pictures together, but they capture this mischievous joy um, that I'm always after. You know, someone in my life who really understands the roles of making a commercial picture and the ridiculousness of it sometimes. Um, I don't think of my work in the category of self-portraits and I wouldn't want it to be described that way either. Um, you know, everybody makes pictures of themselves. I think it's, it's a, photo a photograph can be a dressing room for a body. Um, and I come back to this idea, which is, you know, our own self is truly the only thing I think we can speak the truth about. 
everything else is a wild guess and we have a lot of um, control over, over ourselves. Here's a photo um, from, from my book, Jane. And Jane and I, I shot this in 2017. Um, at the time when I was making this work, I was thinking about the, the power that a photographer has, the dynamic of a of subject and um, subject and photographer. And the photographer always has the power in the end. Um, I was very angry when I was making these pictures and um, I had just stopped working as a model to be in other people's pictures. And I didn't really understand how to deal with kind of like this demon in photography. I, I think of like its past and the photographer versus the subject and um, photog I wanted to make a picture without the element of fear. And I still don't really have an answer for that. I think that there's always this, this element. Um, I have a lot of friends who are painters and they have, they have a lot less limits, um, I think, in their work with, you know, the nude doesn't shock in a painting, but it's frustrating for me that it does in a picture. So having this chord, I felt so, was so literal. I think it's like a kind of a common thing of like giving control um, or having the model kind of have me attached to a chord felt like, as a lot of the time I find the way out in a lot of my pictures is through this idea of joy. Um, revolting through joy. Um, and I think it gets confusing because I don't think joy is not necessarily like smiling in the face of pain. Um, it's not covering up pain with a smile, but it can be kind of like, you know, being out and having like lunch with a friend and your ex walks by and you're like laughing, you know, eating a salad or something. Um, it's like this joy of finding a new happiness or joy being resistance to, to what's not expected. Um, I think photographs, um, photographs have a, a kind of a history of, of photographing sadness or for me, especially around like this idea of other, of being other and, and the history of kind of photography of photographing other people. Um, and I think oftentimes when I'm when I'm shooting with joy involved, people think I'm selling them something because that's the pictures that we know the semiotics of it is like a smile with um, like, like the woman eating a salad <laughs> meme that was going around. Um, but this image is called Thanks, and it was it was made right before Thanksgiving. Um, Bobby introduced me to an idea called mirror neurons, which is to bear witness to someone else's healing um, or to bear witness to someone else's healing process is um, healing for you, like a mirror neuron. I don't know a lot about it, but a mirror neuron in your, in your brain and this, this theme that um, the people that I photograph all have, all have very self-reflective relationships with their bodies. Um, and in return, I, I have self-reflective relationship with my body and we share that and it's like group therapy. I think someone else's session can be as impactful, um, as impactful as your own. Um, these next few pictures are, are a, a body or a series of pictures um, I made to kind of give myself a physical in the way that a doctor would. Um, photographs historically, I think are, are souvenirs to bring with you into the future or, or to remember how to recognize someone that maybe you hadn't met before. Um, I sometimes think photography can be like this item to ward off feeling like a freak or feeling like a freak in a bad way. Um, I made these next few pictures to confront or the idea was to confront the physical, the physical body to, uh, to give myself um, an examination kind of that way that a doctor would and, um, and kind of leaning into what's already possible with what's here. Um, 
there's always a need in my work to be seen beyond an explanation or, you know, I think we always, it's a part of being here as I think having to summarize and um, I don't know, I think, uh, I think by ultimately by authentically understanding ourselves, um, we all collectively evolve. And I think picture, pictures can just be sometimes, you know, witnessing each other work. Um, approaching the self in photography for me has allowed for a lot of growth. This picture is called Summer Body Two. Um, I work a lot with hair and makeup artists in, in making these pictures. I think hair and makeup artists are enormously special people. Um, I work with artists like Kaylee Kennedy and Rob Talti, Natasha Saravino, um, Sylvia Sincota, and they all understand kind of what, they all understand and, and they work with bodies in a way I don't think we discuss enough. Um, I think to have, have to have this talent which allows you to see people in a new way or allows the person to see themselves in a new way offers huge transformation and I don't think people understand or treat that job with like more respect or uh, you know they can move a body in a way no one else can this picture is actually of of Rob Talti who is like I call him my wake guy um, and this is a picture of Carly Mark, who is an artist and designer. And excuse me, ultimately, when in making this picture, she was telling me she was so, um, she's like, I love this picture. I always come back to it. It's like how I kind of want to be seen and be seen in this way. And I think, you know, working with hair and makeup artists, when we see ourselves in these new ways, um, we get to imagine new ways of being in relation to those around us. And um, that's the huge impact of photography for me is seeing, seeing from another perspective, um, understanding that we all have these unseen parts that are sometimes more important than the physical. Um, this picture is called Two in Garage and it's from 2019. Um, I'm kind of at the mercy of where I have, I've been at the mercy of where I, I've been at the mercy of locations. I've been at the mercy of, of, of spaces that people allow me into to make my work. Um, understanding where to find my light was very important for my practice. It's guided my work. Um, where, where does my light live in a room that I've never been in? Where does my light live in a cave? Um, where's my light in like the back of a car in a passenger seat? Like, it's where it's where my pictures are, and um, th this garage became um, a space for me to work in after I, I lost my studio in New York. Um, it got sold and it's being maybe turned into a bathhouse, which is kind of nice. Um, but the garage became a subject that I didn't mean to happen. Um, and garages, alleyways, places that are falling down. Um, they're all spaces that I was making work in and um, would always kind of have this dream of being in like a more clean space. Uh, and now I've started to realize that it's really where my voice is. And um, another formative idea for my work is availableism. Avail availableism, it, I learned from Kembra Fowler, um, who I, I worked with for a while and it's all about using what's around you. I think photography has been for me a practice in gratitude. You know, I, I had like a repeating pattern in myself where um, I think I don't have enough materials. I don't have, an, I don't have anybody to photograph. I don't have enough. And um, working with kind of availableism, I was seeing um, how much I have. I have so much around me. Um, and also with availableism, like I always wanted to, as a photographer, photograph something so much greater than myself was this kind of idea I can boil it down to. And um, I've noticed in photographing or focusing on such a smaller group of people, people that I have a connection with, 
um, it ends up reflecting a much larger story. It, it's, it's an imprint and a reflection or an accumulation of shared beliefs. Um, availableism helped me trust my gut and, you know, see everything as a main character. Another formative um, idea for my work was um, kind of understanding, well, kind of understanding my light, but also understanding um, understanding where where to find it, um, and also understanding really people, um, the people who who would work in that light for me. Um, this is a photograph from 2018, um, Seth, Bobby, myself, and Eves, and uh, and kind of on that note too, this idea of of community or um, I listen to my friends and I I'm, I'm feel like I'm reflecting back the listening and and making pictures. It's more about what I hear and less about what I see. Um, that's really a big part of my practice and following um, artists like Alice O'Malley, who is a mentor to me. Um, she's been photographing downtown New York artists and it's with such sensitivity and in understanding of, I think the understanding of the passage of time, um, that, you know, pictures can be artifacts of connections made or photographs of community and protection and collectively transgressing. Um, and that's something I really learned from, from her. I love, how, I love how working in the landscape of intimacy sounds. Um, I often find myself photographing myself. I often photograph the stages of transformation. Um, and I don't know until later that I'm photographing a stage of transformation, but building these playgrounds and or these staged pictures, you can say, um, I'm hopeful when I'm building these playgrounds that a con connection can be made. And I made these pictures uh, of this installation during the first few months of quarantine. Um, and I made it twice actually, because the first time it was eaten by rats and um, the second time um, it wasn't. And it's it's made to scale with the transformation scene from Cinderella. And um, there's a really great talk about pixie dust by, by Marlon West in the history of pixie dust at Disney. Um, it's this moment, it's the, always this moment before brand newness which I loved that, that phrase. And I went through the animation cells and I chose this one mid frame or, or mid transformation. And Marlon says, here are the characters, uh, the character and the animation are interlinked. It's the moment before brand newness. Um, and there's, there was a big resistance to me in making this picture, this idea of twee or, you know, the, the, the resistance to working with something that felt kind of twee to me. Um, I was asked to write something for um, the British Journal of Photography for this picture. And it says, it feels like it's a part of the work for me now that transgressions for the tweet at heart are not a prince that rescues, but rather the glamor of transformation, a new dress that fits and a carriage that takes them away from just surviving. Um, these next couple of pictures were I made inspired by Ethel Eckelberger, who's a playwright and a drag performer as part of Charles Ludlum's um, The Ridiculous Theater Company in the 70s in New York. And when I was looking through these archives, I felt like Ethel was just like this, this angel when I saw them. And it's a hair and makeup that I'm always after. Um, Ethel played both male and female characters in, in many experimental theater productions. and um, I felt like it was just a makeup that I really wanted to um, champion. And I'm at the time I was looking at posters, um, the art of midnight films in San Francisco, archival documents, um, you know, the avant-garde of, of the late 60s and 70s, 
artists like Sylvester, um, the Cockettes, Angels of the Light, and Stephen Arnold. It was really for me about finding these sort of utopian communities and experimental counterculture. And nothing as nothing stops me in my tracks like that work. Um, it just has a little bit of everything for me, and it's very important for for my work. Um, I made this picture really recently. I'm kind of being, I think, a little naughty by showing it, <laughs> but without giving too much away. Um, or the long story short, I had to figure out how to shoot talent who isn't there, and. I, lo I love this aspect of photography is the truth. Um, something staged isn't the truth. And in this idea of photographing a talent that's not there, um, I had to kind of figure out ways around it. And um, it was a kind of like a little joke for me, the, the valley shadow of the death with Roger Fenton and the idea of like the cannonball. Um, But ultimately, in this idea of truth, I, I do believe, especially photography and, and feelings over facts. Um, this was a picture I, I shot during COVID as well of the term shelter in place. Um, in COVID, as this idea of this, at, at first I felt like COVID and its more intense moments was this, was this ghost. This, and it was a very isolating time for everyone, I think. Um, but I was asked to make, mo I was asked to make this picture um, and it was a very literal kind of idea for COVID for me. And in response to it, more um, a more post-COVID feeling of we're still in the pandemic. And I mean, um, this picture is called Contact. I made it in 2022. Um, and it's the need for connection. Um, you know, being with friends and that I think a lot of my practice before was photographing groups and people and COVID kind of um, gave this shift of, of being really one-on-one -on -one or um, photographing myself more. This is Terrain Futurum and from 2017. This for a portfolio I put together for the New York Times um, called The Horse in the Rough, which I think eventually became a glint in the kindling's book. Um, at the time I was looking at photographs of Moybridge and this idea of truth coming up again. Um, the Moybridge idea of does a horse's feet touch the ground in a trot um, kind of became this barometer for truth. And I think photography has such a complicated history with that. And for me, it's come down to this idea of feelings over facts and um, taking a picture with the intention of getting an answer. Um, and, you know, not always getting an answer, but still having this, this artifact left. Um, this is an image of Paul Monroe and myself. Um, I was introduced to Paul working on the Greer LinkedIn archives. Um, Greer, Greer quickly became one of my favorite artists. Um, she was a part of the Lower East Side scene in New York in the 1980s, um, made a lot of handmade dolls of, of artists and celebrities and these big room sized installations and photography and Paul over was Paul's um, her life partner and um, oversees her archive and Paul graciously led me through through her work and the work of many other artists I've discovered through her dolls and when the invitation came to photograph together. Um, I knew I really wanted to make pictures together and I feel like a large I feel like a large clunky horse a lot of the time especially um, in, in the stage of a picture. Um, so this is really just a reflection of a friendship made through the love of, of, of history. I shot this in 2019. Um, this picture was, this picture is called Behind Glass. And I took this while, while on a trip. It was at a time where I was, I felt, a connection to this helmet, I think dealing with like that, that horse idea. Um, and I was flying a lot of, to a lot of trips with it and bringing it over with me. And um, this idea of like a physical binary was something I was looking for. And that I felt like that binary was also, um, was coming from myself and this idea of 
the language I used to talk about my work in photography or, or my identity was, um, could be very isolating. And it, it, it made me, a, another formative idea for my work here was this, um, this activist and artist, Avram Finkelstein, um, the founder, he was a founding member of ACT UP, uh, Silence Equals Death Collective Symbol. And um, he was asked in an interview, how do academic conversations apply where um, to somebody, how do, how do these academic conversations apply to somebody who drives a cab for a living? And his answer was like, I worry that the language alienates the very people those conversations are about. And I felt really connected to that. Um, it was a really formative idea to my work, um, was keeping, keeping the work visually accessible sometimes and, and being able to talk about it in a way um, that I felt could have a reach a larger audience. Um, and also just focusing, I mean, here was just an image focusing on play between, between friends. Um, this is a photo of myself and, and Michaela Strauss, who's a musician. Again, coming back to this idea of, of photography being a dressing room or a place to try on forms, future forms, a potential body, um, ultimately with the intention of, of a photograph being affirming. Um, this picture is body one, that one previously is body two. And this, this picture is um, manip manipulated to be the dimensions of a famous model. And I think I, I come back to this idea in, in creating visuals for other people in my work wh where if you can have this idea to, to allow everybody to limitly transform at their own will, um, you know, without your own expectations put on them. Um, it's a very specific freedom that I think photography allows for that to happen um, or to non-verbally and to non-verbally non give people permission. I think that's where an invitation happens. Um, a lot of the times when I'm, when I'm coming up with a picture, um, I'll draw or I'll um, do research. And I had originally drawn this picture of a person with swans and it was a small narrative I had built about the swans being sort of protectors and you know, also, but also being controlled. And I drew it for someone else. Um, but this is Hayden Dunham, who's a fantastic artist. Um, and Hayden told me a story one day about swans and I knew that I had the picture wrong and that this picture was for them. And then shortly after we got the invitation to work together. Um, and that's a good example in, in my process in making pictures. It's something I called mirroring, um, receiving a reflection and waiting to see whose reflection it was. It's often like this anonymous feeling, but it, it's, an, it's a more intuitive approach, this idea of mirroring. Um, and I've been much happier making work that way. Um, I think rituals between friends can be really um, reflective and important. And I think being separated physically, has, it's, it's such a theme nowadays too, but um, connected on another energetic plane. Um, so much happens, I feel like above and putting that into a photograph feels really intimate and it feels like it's been really um, moving in my work to, to work in that way of, you know, feelings over facts. Um, and that's kind of more surrealist. It leads me to a more surrealist way of thinking, you know, the, the limitations of a, of a body um, allowing for, for freedom. I made this idea, I made this idea around the same time as a photograph farther back with, with the baby. Um, and kind of thinking about the limitations we're told the body has. Um,
and that's what kind of it led me to creating these more surrealist feeling pictures, the thinking about a body and feelings, in fact, what is true. And I always imagine this picture like Hayden had just slid down the chimney and was kind of, it's a delivery room. Um, and, you know, there's these wings flapping and the fire is still burning that, that they flew through. And um, it's just this, this feeling of birth and, um, I think so angels too are like the sort of messenger and um, that's the reason I really enjoy, I enjoyed the, the reference of an angel because it feels like a messenger and I feel like I have people in my life who are these, these sort of messengers, um, as messengers of something new, messengers of a new way of thinking and something that offers a new perspective. And I enjoy photographing people who, who I think give me new perspectives of how to live. It's, tapping into that magic space of, of limitlessness and um, being reflective. Another picture of, of Bobby. It's more recent. Um, this is the final picture and I shot this picture during the pandemic in Paris and at the time that this photo was taken um, everybody in the studio was singing this French lullaby to this baby and, you know, probably 20 or 30 people who just happened to know the song in unison. And it was one of my favorite moments of being a photographer so far. Um, I think photography can invite us, you know, not just to this surrealist world beyond ours, but one which already shines through the cracks of, of our own and a world I think that can transform for or is transforming for the better and you know I hope that that can be the impact of of making pictures and making pictures with others is is documenting this the shift that I feel like is happening <laughs>